or may not feel it. But make no mistake, you and I, we're in a life and death, drag them out, knock out fight for our focus. We feel it every single day. The temptation to push and strive to focus on our problems and our goals and our dreams and then to create our own momentum in our life through our own self effort. Every single day we wake up, we feel it. It's called the grind. And you and I have been indoctrinated in this way of life since the very first breath we took. This is what we talked about last week. And then Jesus comes along with his good news and says, stop pushing. Come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you what? Rest. That's right. And then what? Don't focus so much on your problems, although they're important to God, but focus on Jesus. Fix our eyes on Jesus because he's the author and perfecter of our faith. And then with our eyes fixed on Jesus, we can then give ourselves to the flow of God's spirit who will create the momentum that we need, not through our own self-effort, but through his power moving in and through and around us. Yay! So good. Remember, though, that each one of these are a fight. They are a battle. You have an enemy that at every one of those stages is opposing you because he knows that if you get just one look, just one look at Jesus, <laughs> it is over for him because you will be fixed on the one who has the power over death and hell and everything in between. And we get to ride on his coattails from here till glory. Amen. And that, that could be the end of the sermon, but it's not. Because we sit there and we say, yeah, well, I, I would. I would focus on Jesus, you know, but my kids... They're just all over me and they never stop. And I, 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 the only place I can hide is my bathroom. How am I supposed to fix my eyes on Jesus in the bathroom? I would, but my boss, he's got these expectations of me. I got to stay focused at work. I would, you know, but my schedule just doesn't allow for it. You don't understand. I don't have a, a, a free moment on my daytime. Like everything is taken. I would, but my energy is depleted. I would fix my eyes on Jesus, Brad, but my energy is just, it's depleted by the end of the day. And all I want to do is just curl up and watch some Netflix and fall asleep scrolling through my phone. I would, I would, Brad, I would focus on Jesus, but my mind, my mind just keeps racing. I lie there in bed and I keep re hashing my day or I keep thinking about tomorrow and all the things that are coming. I would fix my eyes on Jesus, but I, I get so distracted. See, I get so distracted. And, and I wonder if, if part of that is, again, that we're stuck in the Moses mindset. Remember what the Moses mindset was, right? Moses would go up on the mountainside to pray, and then he'd get charged up, and then he would leave the presence of God to come down into the day-to-day -day grind where he would long to get back up on the mountaintop until he would get, you know, into the God's presence again, get charged up. And I wonder if some of us are still stuck in the Moses mindset. We're, we're still thinking either or. We're thinking either I can go up and be with God, I can spend time with God focused on God, which is important, or I can do the day-to-day -day things in my life. In other words, the day-to-day -day things in life get in the way of me fixing my eyes on Jesus. Because down here, on the plains, there's no time. Like Moses had the time, but there's no time once my day gets rolling to fix my eyes on Jesus. And yet I keep going back to King David, who said, I, I have set the Lord always before me. I've fixed the eyes of my heart, my imagination on Jesus, on the Lord. So, so when he's looking at Goliath, he's not just seeing a giant. He's seeing his, his Lord there. He's like, I'm going to knock you out, right? He's not just seeing Herod, or, or, sorry, Herod, King Saul on his tail. He's seeing Jesus as his rear guard 
You know, he's not just seeing all the political intrigue. He's seeing his Lord giving him wisdom to direct his steps through everything he's facing. And if King David, who's ruling an entire nation, can say, I have set the Lord always before me, then maybe you and I, we need to work on this. We need to work this out. So here's the, here's the bottom line for today. Okay, I'm going to give you the punchline. And I want you to hang on to this. I want you to hang on to this because your distractions aren't just a fact of life. They're where the fight for your focus is won or lost. Your distractions are not just a way of life. They are the battleground where your destiny is hanging in the balance. Because as we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, We can run with endurance the race set before us. Amen? So how about you and I uh, tackle this battle, the battle, number two, distractions today. How about we just get rid of that dichotomy? Either I fix my eyes on Jesus or I'm down in the valley. What if we get rid of the mountaintop entirely, so to speak, uh, at least for the sake of this discussion today, and we said, no matter what I'm doing, no matter where I am, I need to fix my eyes on Jesus because he's there. He's there. And it's in my looking to Jesus that I will find a way of escape, that I will find my way forward, that I will find hope and peace and joy and strength and everything else I need. Can I get an amen? Please just humor me and type it in the comments. Jesus knows and he listens and he's, he's reading the comments too. So that's awesome. He's, he knows what's in your heart, but he has all, you get what I'm talking about. Okay. So uh, there's a story that came up in my uh, prayer as I was thinking about this message. It's the story that happens directly after Jesus, immediately after Jesus has fed the 5,000. And uh, it's a pretty crazy story. And it's going to fit so beautifully into what we're going to do today and is going to kind of wrap with a bow our, our little mini series within the Holy Spirit thing on fixing our eyes on Jesus. You ready? Tell, tell God you're ready. Tell Jesus you're ready. Jesus, I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay. Right on. Here's how the story goes. Jesus made his disciples get in the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. So just want to pause there. Look at what Jesus did. These guys are beat. They've been handing out like baguettes and, and, you know, fish all day long. Twelve basketfuls left over. All this stuff. This is incredible miracle, right? So awesome. And they're exhausted. They're blown away, but they're exhausted. So Jesus who of course isn't exhausted, of course he's exhausted. He, he says, how about you guys get in the boat, go on ahead of me, you know, across the lake. And they're like, ha, okay. <laughs> you know, just Jesus, Jesus says something, we just do it. So I don't know how he's gonna get there, but okay, we'll meet you there somehow. And so he dismisses the, he, he dismisses the crowd, you know, shaking hands, hugging babies, doing the whole thing as people leave. Thank you, pastor, for a good service. He's doing this, you know, for thousands of people as they disperse. Then it says that after leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. Uh, By the way, look what he's doing. He is actually going up on the mountaintop. I just want to point that out. There is a place for that, that special alone time with God. And that, that can't be replaced actually, but that's not what we're talking about here today. But this is what Jesus does. That's a whole other thing. We're going to get into that. Uh, probably in a, on another occasion. So here's how the story plays out. Watch this. Later that night, the boat, which the boat, the disciples' boat, was in the middle of the lake. And he, Jesus, was alone on land. And he saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. What are they doing? Let's review. What are they doing? Think in terms of the message I've been speaking for the last number of weeks. They are striving. They are pushing in their own might because they have done this before. They are fishermen. They are fishermen and they know the lake and they're on the oars. And there's like, I don't know, there's 12 of them. I don't know if they got, you know, six on each side, just like, and they're, they're going at it for hours and they're not making any progress because why? The wind, the spirit is against them. In a way, right? They're, they're, they're struggling here to make things on their, on their, and what, they're, what are they doing? They're focused on their problems. 
getting from here to there, their goals, you know, getting across the lake, their dreams of a warm bed that night. They are focused on the waves. They are focused on the wind. They are focused on everything but what? Jesus. That's right. And what are they trying to do? Create their own momentum. Now, you, you got to look at this story and you got to think, but what else would they be doing, Brad? <laughs> They're in a boat, right? Of course, they're going to push. Of course, they're going to focus on the problems and the goals and the dreams. And of course, they're going to try to create your, you know, their own momentum. That's what you do in a boat. <laughs> and so this is just, but it's just a beautiful illustration of, of what we do. We're like, what else would we do? Like we get out of bed in the morning. You're telling me not to push, but that's what I'm called to do. And, and like, that's what my boss expects me to do. That's what my kids need me to do. That's what my, you know, my spouse expects me to do, to push, 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 and to set my eyes on my problems and to fix them and to set goals and then to create momentum for me and my family. Like, this is why I'm here, isn't it? Is there another way? It doesn't kind of seem like it, right? In this story, there's no way. What else would they be doing? And then we read this. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. <laughs> so the, the wind kicks up, the storm starts to brew. It's like a little squall without the, the rain, right? And it's buffeting the boat and it's super windy. Jesus is praying and his hair starts going all of this. And his father's like, hey, that wind, yeah, that's your ride, right? So Jesus facing the same wind that the disciples are facing is walking on the lake while they are pushing. He is walking. Watch what happens next. Look at this. This is so good. He was about to pass by them. <laughs> He's about to pass by them. Why is he going to pass by them? Does this, does this make any sense to you? They're, they're alone in the boat. They're struggling. And God is near, but he's about to pass by. Why? Well, first of all, first of all, I, wanna, I just want to point out that walking in the power of the Spirit across a storm, he is making better headway than 12 guys rowing for their lives in their own strength. <laughs> like he's like on your left and he's about to pass by them. He's and they're like, what the, like he's, how is this even, how is this even happening? Okay. But the second thing I want to point out is he's about to pass them by. Why? Because he, he walks close enough so that they can catch a glimpse of him. And he's waiting for them to call out to him. He's like, he's making himself visible. But how many of you know, it's up to us to call out to God. Like he's there. He's like, look at me, look at me, look at me, fix your eyes on me. But until you call out to me, until you call out to me. So good. Now, I also want to point out that every one of them were freaked out. Look at this. He was about to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the lake, when they saw him walking on the lake. I don't know who saw him first. Like, ah, there's somebody walking on the lake. They thought he was a ghost. And they cried out because they all saw him. And were terrified. So let me point out, they all saw Jesus. Every single one of them saw Jesus. None of them at this moment recognized Jesus. So they saw Jesus, but they didn't see Jesus. You know what I'm saying? Jesus was walking by. He's like, hey, you may want to, you know, I'm right here. And, and they're looking at him and they can't see him for who he is. Why? Because Jesus looks different in a storm. Jesus looks different in a storm. Remember last week we talked about all the different facets of the jewel of Jesus' character, right? That he's the lion and he's the lamb. And they had never maybe seen him in the storm before. They'd never seen him walking on water before. And how many of you know that when you're primed to see Jesus a certain way, he could be walking right by in a different form and you do not see him, but he's there. You see him, but you don't see him. Are you getting this? Are you getting this? It's not that you don't see Jesus. It's that you don't see Jesus for who he is, right? And, and this, is what, this is the thing, is that when someone is walking in the power of the Spirit, 
like energized by the spirit, like, like on a foundation that we don't even know exists. He's walking on the wind and the waves. He looks different and he freaks them out. This is something that happens when you see someone that is this walking on water in their life, like they're defying the odds. They've got grace in the face of persecution. They've got strength when they should be exhausted. They've got hope when they should be hopeless. It's like a ghost, man. It's like, it's like who even are you? Where is this power coming from? So they cry out. They cry out. How many of you know that it's hard to see what you're not looking for? Hard to see what you're not looking for. Are they looking for Jesus on the storm? No. What are they assuming about Jesus? They assume, just like we assume, where's Jesus? When can I meet with Jesus? He's on the mountaintop. That's where we left him, right? That's where I met him last, was on the mountaintop, maybe in my daily devotions. And that was like two weeks ago. So he's up on the mountain. He's not here. Therefore, whatever I'm encountering here is what? Up to me. Right? So it's hard to see what we're not looking for. But if we're looking for Jesus, we will start to recognize him. See, because it's hard to recognize Jesus when we're trying to find him through the filter of our frustrations. It's hard to find Jesus when we're trying to find him through the filter of our frustrations. So they're seeing him through the wind. They're seeing him through the waves. They're seeing him through the futility of rowing and getting nowhere. And as a result, they, they're seeing him, but they don't see him. Now, luckily, God has mercy on us. And he doesn't just leave us to our devices. See, he, he, he alerts us. Hey, this is me. This is me. And he's training his disciples. That's what Jesus is doing. Because he's, he's, he's not going to be with them forever in the flesh, right? He's going to be invisible with them by his spirit. So they need to learn to see him when they're not directly, physically with him. Right? Okay, so here it is. So this is what happens immediately. He spoke to them and said, take courage. It's I. It is I. It's me. It's me, guys. It's me. Don't be afraid. Right? So now, now his, his presence and his voice are starting to come together. And, and this is how the story concludes. Then he climbed into the boat with them and the wind died down. Can you imagine how Peter felt at this moment? Reading Mark's version of the story. He's like, give me that thing. Give me that scroll. Then he climbed into the boat with them. The wind died down. You, you missed the best part. The whole, like, I got out of the boat and I walked on water. Maybe, maybe that would be important, Mark. Oh, so he's I can just picture, you know, <laughs> Peter's like, Matthew, Matthew, let me see your version. Yeah, yeah, Matthew's going to tell the rest of the story. So Matthew, Matthew includes something the other gospel writers don't. Uh, obviously, they're more focused on Jesus, but, but there's something here that Matthew wants us to get. So the best part of the story, in my opinion, <laughs> is, is not just that Jesus walked on water, but what happens next, which is super instructive. Watch this. So as Peter, or as Matthew records it, Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water, right? Between the whole, hey, it's me, and he comes into the boat, Peter does something no one else in the boat does. They are all in the same boat, and we are all in the same boat. We all see Jesus. We have the promise. He will never leave us or forsake us. He is walking by. He's passing by. He is flowing by, by going with the flow of the Spirit. And there's enough there that we can fix our eyes on Him, start a conversation in Him, and everything can change. We are all in the same boat until, until some of us decide to get out of the boat. Look at this. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, Jesus said. See, all of them were pushing. All of them were straining. All of them were reaping the, the, the fruit of their own futility. And, only, and they all saw Jesus. 
They're rowing and they're trying to, you know, outrun the ghost and they're trying even harder and they're freaked out. Only Peter kind of puts down the oars and says, wait, God, if that's you, tell me to come and I'll come. Right? And, and Jesus is like, dude, that's awesome. Right? So come, come on down. Not what I was thinking, but hey, come on. Right? And so only Peter stops pushing and fixes his eyes on Jesus. They all saw Jesus, but none of them really saw Jesus until Peter turned his gaze from his problems and his strain and his futility and gave Jesus his full attention. What happens next? What happens next is Peter says, uh, see you suckers, that's my ride, right? Because remember, they were straining and Jesus was passing them as he was walking on the water, okay? So this is what happens next. So good, so good, so good. All right. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. <laughs> Probably looking like a toddler, like, <laughs> oh, like the first couple of steps, whoa, okay. And he's, and he's doing it, right? Where is Peter looking? Where ha- he has to be looking, like right here, right here, right here. See, all the dis- disciples saw Jesus, but they didn't see Jesus until Peter turned aside from his problems, fixed his eyes on Jesus. And what Peter saw was something the other disciples didn't see because they were still glancing back and forth. They were still trying to work the problem, fixing their eyes on Jesus, fixing their eyes on the problem. Peter gives Jesus his whole attention. And he sees Jesus looking back at him. And it's the look in Jesus' eyes that says, that's it, I'm going. Boom. And he's, he gets out of the boat. He came forward, starts walking on the water. Oh. Now this also shows us that just because I refuse to push doesn't mean there's not work to do. So for for those of you who've been thinking, okay, but if I'm not pushing, how am I supposed to get stuff done? The answer lies in the energy, the the flow in which we are doing the work that we're doing, not that we're not working. So Jesus is saying, I will give you rest as we labor together. So Peter gets out of the boat. He's walking on water. He's still doing stuff. He's still making progress. He's just not doing it in his own strength like the other 11 are doing in the boat. Everybody sees Jesus, but only Peter sees Jesus. And then as he sees Jesus, he starts to see Jesus looking back at him. This process of learning to stop pushing and to fix my eyes on Jesus has been the journey of a lifetime the last few months. And it's notice that it's not that the storm doesn't matter. It's just that when I fix my eyes on Jesus, he gives me a different power to navigate the storm. And options open up to me that wouldn't have opened up to me had I remained in my own pushing, striving mentality. Sometimes in the middle of my storm, when I fix my eyes on Jesus, I'll be having a tough conversation or I'll be walking through something difficult or I'm driving through traffic. Uh, I just get a sense of his presence with me and it's enough. It's like he, I see him looking back at me, right? Uh, one of my favorite things about uh, being married, honestly, this, is, this sounds so silly, but it's so true. It's so simple. It's so beautiful. Is that when I'm in public with Shauna, sometimes um, we'll be at a church service or something. I'm about to go get up and speak. And all she'll do is just give my hand a little squeeze, just a little. And in that moment, I just feel like her love and her support kind of move from her to me. And I walk up to that podium or that lectern, whatever, and I speak knowing that she's with me, right? Sometimes, you know, I'll be looking and I'll be speaking, I'll be preaching, and, and, and somebody will be tracking with me, right? And I, I see them, they just give me this little nod. It's like, go, go, go. And, and it's, that's how it is with Jesus sometimes. It's like, I'm, I'm walking through life, I'm struggling through things, and I, I just see Jesus just, just, 
there in, in front of me by the, with the eyes of my heart. And he's like, he's nodding to me or he's smiling or he's going, you got this. Or he's, he's giving me this little affirmation. He puts his hand on me. That's something that he loves to do. And with the eyes of my heart, I'll be like, oh, Jesus, what do I do? And he leans forward. I can see him with the eyes of my heart, putting his hands on my cheeks like this, right? And just going, I got you. I got you right? Just like that in the middle of the storm, just like that. And it's him, not just that I'm fixing my eyes on him, it's that he's got his eyes fixed on me that is so transformational. Unfortunately, unfortunately, this is not where the story ends, because listen to this, but when he who Peter saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink. It's like the enemy's going, okay, he's got his eyes fixed on Jesus. Cue the waves, like the Truman Show, right? Cue the wind. And, and, and as a result, Peter starts doing what the disciples in his boat behind him have been doing. They're looking back and forth from Jesus to the storm, from Jesus to the storm. And he starts to do that. And if, before you know it, the devil's like, ha ha, I made you look. And he's looking at the waves. He's looking at the winds. And he starts to sink. So we need to be so very careful. This is why it's so important to fix our eyes on Jesus. Because how many of you know that you move towards what you're focused on? You move towards what you're focused on. How many of you have ever, in gym class, walked across one of those balance beams, right? Where they set, set out that little, the little bleacher seats. And you're supposed to walk from one end to the other. And they're kind of narrow. And you're, you're walking like this. How many of you know that if you focus on your feet, you're down? If you focus on the bar beneath you, you're down. If you focus on the floor, you move towards the floor. You always move to what's, towards what you're focused on. But if you focus on your goal... Suddenly all the other elements that you've been trying to balance are no longer as important and you can walk confidently across that beam. In the same way, Peter starts focusing on the waves. What happens? He moves towards the waves. So many Christians find, find this so difficult to grasp. We, we focus on our sin. We focus on our sin and where do we go? into more sin because you always move towards what you're focused on. You don't avoid sin by looking at sin. You avoid sin by looking at Jesus who has conquered sin in the grave. Something else I want you to see, and this is this why this battle is so important to win, is that whoever or whatever has my attention has me. See, as he, as he starts looking to the waves, the waves claim him. As you look to your problems, your problems will claim you. As you look to your sin, your sin will claim you. If you look to your guilt and your fear, it will claim you. The wind and the waves will claim you because whoever or whatever has your attention has you. So if your eyes are fixed on Jesus, just picture this. No matter what's happening around me, someone hits me, someone insults me, someone discourages me. The wind is blowing, the waves are blowing, but my eyes are fixed on Jesus. Who do I belong to? I don't belong belong to the voices. I don't belong to the discouragement. I don't belong to any of that. I belong to Jesus because my eyes are fixed on Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Now, let me ask you a question. Because <laughs> how many of you in Peter's situation, I'm there, would have diverted our gaze to the wind and the wave? It seems kind of important to understand the waves and the wind. This seems like a big deal, but how many of you know that there is nothing Peter could have done in his own strength to improve his situation? Once he got out of that boat, once he started walking with Jesus, there was nothing he could do in his own strength to prop himself up, to balance more effectively, to defy gravity. None of these things were in his power to influence. Now, as he sinks, what does he do? He fixes his eyes back on Jesus, the only one that can save him. And he cries out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. And he says, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? You want to know something really cool? 
that word doubt means hesitate. Hesitate. Why did you waffle? Why did you allow yourself to be blown and tossed by the wind, doubting like James says? Why did you allow yourself to become unstable by averting your gaze from me? Don't you believe that if you fix your eyes on me, I will, through you, attend to the wind and the waves. But you, your job is to see me. Don't hesitate. Don't falter. Don't do this back and forth, back and forth. Fix your eyes on me. And when they climbed into the boat, he and Jesus, the wind died down, lessons over than those who were in the boat, which would include Peter, worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the son of God. I need you to hear this as we close. The Christian life is walking on water. It's impossible without fixing our eyes on Jesus and walking in the power of the Spirit. Walking the Christian life is impossible. It is water walking. It is walking above sin and death and hell. And you and I, there's nothing we can do in our own strength to better our own position. So we better fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, and run with endurance the race set before us. Because that's what Jesus did and made possible for us. So this week, the waves are going to roll. This week, the winds are going to blow. The voices are going to sound. And you're going to be thinking, I'm on my own. You're going to be in the mode of pushing and Jesus is going to walk by. And you're going to catch a glimpse of him and you're going to go, is that Jesus? Is that not Jesus? So ask him, is that you, Jesus? And if he says, yep, then you go. You leave your striving. You fix your eyes on Jesus and you can walk on the water of the storm of your life because he is the captain of your soul. Amen. And if you falter, if you start looking back and you start to sink, what do you do? Lord, save me. And immediately he will reach in and pull you up and say, let's do this. Let's do this. Amen. Amen. Let's do this now. Let's fix our eyes on him. Well, I hope that you've seen that this list of things that vies for our attention is not unimportant. If it's important to you, it's probably important to God, but that Jesus calls us to fix our eyes on him so that he can help us navigate all the things that we have to balance in our lives. So good. Well, I'm glad that you joined us. I pray in Jesus' name that Jesus, as he passes you by this holiday, he's going to be able to get your attention, that you will fix your eyes on him, and he will empower you, enable you to walk on the water of the storms of your life, not because of your own spirituality or effort, but because he's just so awesome. Have a good day.